They have, yes. Um, really works um, on, on several um, in, in several areas. Our, our core focus is really to try and help ensure that scientific information is being presented to decision makers, the public, uh, uh, media representatives, and so forth, but also helping members of the scientific community understand the needs and expectations of those other um, sort of data user or knowledge user communities, such as, as policymakers, uh, general public, uh, and so forth. So we have a number of programs that are really designed to um, facilitate the development and advancement of scientific policy, uh, as well as, as trying to, to really promote a robust uh, national science policy that that's really helps serve the needs of the scientific community, but also the broader good. Um, uh, right now, we sort of focus our efforts around three areas. That's um, primarily funding for scientific research, promotion of scientific integrity, um, preservation of peer review and integrity, um, combating politicization of science, things like that, and also the promotion of quality science education, which often result, uh, relates to the promotion of, of evolution instruction. Um, the next slide... Um, shows uh, a little bit more of some of the kinds of things that we do on a regular basis. We work with our member organizations to conduct um, everything from congressional briefings and, and policy briefings to facilitating press conferences. Uh, we, we are leaders on a number of, of scientific coalitions at the national level working to promote um, science policy and investments in scientific research. Um, Next slide. We also um, work to facilitate and, and, and support direct advocacy, whether that is um, staff here on the, at AIBS working directly with um, policymakers in the executive or legislative branches, or it's working to help individual scientists and in our member organizations communicate their, their findings and their, their concerns to policymakers. So we, we've, in the last year or so, launched a couple of new initiatives around that. And you see one, if you go to our, our homepage, you'll see the Legislative Action Center. That's one mechanism by which, and one tool that we have now that allows individual scientists to communicate directly with policymakers. We also, next month, are launching the first reverse congressional visits event where scientists meet with their members of Congress while they're on recess back in the district in August. The other sorts of program area, in addition to sort of direct advocacy, we also facilitate and provide um, policy analysis through a, uh, an array of, of publications from the biweekly policy report to columns in bioscience and other forums. Uh, we also per periodically uh, publish unique publications and conduct training programs. And right now we have a... Um, policy and, and media workshop training programs that we're able to provide that really is, is guided at helping scientists become more comfortable and effective advocates and communicators of science. And that really sort of segues to today's program. Can you your intro and I'll if we can go to the next, next slide, um, when you get it. which today's program really is, is a, another example of that, of, of a successful effort that, that was um, – program that was developed to, to really facilitate the effective and timely communication of, of research findings to decision makers. And so um, I'm looking forward to hearing more details about the Science Links program in, in just a second. Um, but it, it again, is, is a, a very timely um, topic because, uh, as we're all well aware, whether it's, it's talking about public health issues and the spread of swine flu or whether it's climate change or the loss of biodiversity, there's any number of, of significant topics right now that, that the public has an interest in and that decision makers, whether it's a, a city mayor or it's a member of Congress, have a need to understand both the issue but also what data and, and what the science is saying. And so it's, it's important that we as scientists figure out how we can help communicate the information they need. They trust scientists. They want the scientific information, but they need help deciphering it. And I think today's webinar will help kind of 
help everybody sort of understand some of the, the process that, that should be considered if, if we're really trying to look at this, especially if we're talking about a concerted effort around a, a large research initiative, um, such as is the projects that have been undertaken by the Hubbard Brook folks. So um, the next slide. Um, so again, I'm about ready to turn this over to uh, Dr. Driscoll, um, and I won't I won't go into his his resume too much because you've all seen that from the registration page. Other than to say that that he has a long and distinguished career um, in, in various aspects of ecosystem studies, environmental science. Um, he's a PI of the Hubbard Brook uh, Research Foundation Science Links Program, which he'll be t discussing in, in just a second. Um, and, and I think this is a very exciting presentation. I've, I've seen um, uh, a good piece of it, and I'm looking forward to it. I hope that, that as we go through the presentation at the end, I think we have a group that's optimally sized for some discussion and some questions and answers, and hopefully we'll be able to kind of look at, at you know, how this is a, a model program that may inform or, or help guide the development of other programs. I think it's also exciting because it not only provides information for scientists, but also for a number of funding agencies who, who sort of hope that science, the, the science they're funding will be translated, but sometimes struggle with how to help make that happen. So with that, I will, I will end my portion of, of the talk at this point. Um, be available for questions at the end, but I will now turn it over to Dr. Driscoll. Thanks, Rob. Uh, this is uh, Charlie Driscoll. I have to confess on the front end I'm a little bit intimidated by all this. I've got all these things on my computer screen, so hopefully this will work out uh, well. Um, so as uh, Rob mentioned, um, I gave a talk um, on this subject at a recent CARI conference. And uh, Rob thought it might be a good subject for webinar, and uh, so he and others at AIBS have, uh, have made this happen, and I'm, I'm quite appreciative uh, for this uh, opportunity, and hopefully we'll have a, a good discussion. Um, I also wanted to uh, introduce my uh, uh, co-conspirator on this, uh, Kathy Fallon Lambert, who is on the line, who has been uh, uh, critical to the success of this program, and I've worked closely with her over the years. She's at Dartmouth College, and I've talked with her about taking some time to add some comments uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Uh, so as Rob uh, indicated, uh, this Science Links program has sort of revolved around uh, Hubbard Brook and um, the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation. Uh, I know some of you, I can see the list, and I know some of you, some of you I, I, I don't know, uh, but just in the way of background information, I'm really a rank-and-file uh, scientist. I have no training in, uh, in uh, science communication, and I've sort of uh, been involved and learned this by fire, so you're very much getting this uh, from a, a scientist's uh, perspective who was to some extent, extent dragged into this type of uh, activity, which I find very rewarding. And, and hopefully you'll, I'm presenting this as a case study, and hopefully there will be a benefit to you, and hopefully we can have some good discussion uh, at the end of the talk. Um, just in the way of background information, on the first slide, uh, you can see, those of you who are not familiar with Hubbard Brook, it's located in uh, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, and you can see the Hubbard Brook landscape on this, uh, this first uh, slide. Um, so in terms of what we're going to do today for the presentation, I'm going to give you some background information on Hubbard Brook and sort of set the historical stage for why we developed this uh, program and what were the drivers behind it and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty approach for these Science Links projects. Uh, there have been four of these projects, and we have a fifth in, uh, in process, which hopefully we'll be finishing up uh, this year or early next year. But, but really, there are sort of three stages involved in this, sort of an organizational stage, an actual synthesis stage where the, the, uh, the synthesis of the science is actually done, and then finally, um, an outreach stage, and each one of these phases is, is quite important to the overall pro 
project. Then I thought I'd give you just a brief overview of some of the projects that we've done and the outreach activities associated with those, and then uh, talk a little bit about assessment. Assessment is very challenging, um, and uh, it's something we have to think about and do a better job on, but I think it's worthwhile to, uh, thinking about the impacts of these projects and how successful they are, and then close with some final, some final thoughts. So a little bit about Hubbard Brook. Um, Hubbard Brook is actually kind of a complicated place, and as I have on this uh, slide here, slide 10, you can really view it as sort of three Hubbard Brooks. Um, the original Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which is uh, part of the White Mountain National Forest, was established by the Forest Service in the mid-50s as a station for hydrologic research. Um, the study was expanded in the early 60s through the efforts of Bob Pierce, who was with the Forest Service, uh, by establishing cooperative agreements with Dartmouth College and specifically uh, Gene Likens, Herb Borman, and Noy Johnson to really expand the scope of the study as more of an ecosystem study. Today, it's an ongoing project. Today, we have maybe 20, 25 institutions that are involved and maybe 75 scientists uh, doing work at the site on ecosystem research. Uh, so it's very much a distributed uh, site. So that leads, leads us to sort of the third Hubbardbrook, which is the Hubbardbrook Research Foundation. And because of this distributed nature of the uh, site, um, a group of scientists thought it would be a good idea to set up a friends group to help us with um, facilitate housing and site laboratory activities. And so we established this group in the early 90s, the Hubbardbrook Research Foundation, as a not-for-profit. And initially we had about half Hubbardbrook scientists and half non-scientists on the uh, on the board, and um, very early on, it was an eye opener to me. The non-scientists uh, were interested in expanding the operation of the Hubbardbrook Research Foundation to really have a very substantive outreach activity, which wasn't on my radar screen at all, and I think many of the other people. But they really got after me and. Um, and challenged me and other scientists to really make science more accessible to the broader community. And I think that that was the initial thinking behind the Science Links uh, program. So if you move on to the next slide, 11, uh, we initiated a project called the Futures Assessment Project. And uh, the person who ran the Futures Assessment, assessment Project and, and did the project was Kathy Fallon Lambert, as a Switzer fellow. Uh, in the uh, mid to late 90s, and basically the question is indicated on the slide what was investigated and to see whether or not there's a gap between ecosystem science and policy. So that's sort of a no-brainer, I guess. But the, the second phase, this critical phase, what could the Hubbardbrook Research Foundation do to help bridge this gap? So later in the slide, you see the three bullets. Those were the findings of this analysis that uh, Kathy did. And uh, not surprising, uh, based on interviews with scientists and policymakers and resource managers, the general consensus uh, from the policymakers and resource managers was that they had relatively poor access to research findings, and they were had limited engagement with scientists to address questions that were really very relevant for their needs. And also, the research that was done really didn't wasn't directed at uh, these specific management questions. Uh, too basic, not enough applied, and not enough thinking about these critical management questions that, that needed to be addressed. So based on that feedback, uh, we decided to launch the uh, Science Links uh, program in 1998. Uh, the next slide uh, is a slide that was actually originally published in Bioscience uh, Peter Grofman was the uh, 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 principal author, uh, and it, the, the, the area in the box, see if I can make this uh, work here, this sort of area right around here, can I make that, oops, this area right in here, not very good at drawing, um, is a conceptual model that uh, was 
was advanced for the Hubberbrook study. The overall objective of the study is to evaluate ecosystem pattern and process and how those those um, how the structure and function of ecosystems vary in time and space in response to disturbance. So the idea behind there is that there are these state factors that are inherent in the ecosystem, time, topography, paramaterial, climate, and biota that control structure and function. And it's also influenced by a series of stochastic factors, natural factors such as uh, climatic events or um, uh, uh, introductions of organisms or human factors such as climate change or air pollution. And we're increasingly interested in ecosystem functions and services such as uh, forest production, water quality, carbon storage, and how policies can influence that through uh, ecosystem structure and function. So the basic observation, the basic research is done by experiments, monitoring, modeling, the traditional approaches. And as part of our scientific work, we do a lot of um, we do a lot of uh, synthesis, either through synthesis volume uh, or or special articles. But the Science Links program, which is shown over on the uh, right hand side, is really what we would consider to be a second order analysis to really try to distill that scientific information down, not only at Hubbard Brook, but regionally to try to address very specific uh, management questions. Okay, so before we get to the nitty gritty, some of the challenges that we sort of identified on the front end. Um, uh, we wanted these programs to really be policy and management relevant, to really take our charge from our board members seriously. Um, another aspect that I personally think is very important and is not, um, and is very controversial, is we felt that the program should inform but not advocate a particular policy. Um, uh, or management strategy. Uh, I personally am not comfortable with advocacy science, although there's a lot of people who are, and I have a lot of discussions with folks about the advantages and disadvantages of this. So this is something we could talk about later on, uh, and a lot of scientists are involved in, in advocacy, but we try to, largely, I think, through my um, urging, I think we try to keep this as best we can uh, just informing policy but not advocating specific uh, policies or management strategies. And in that regard, we wanted to try to provide an objective analysis. So we would try to do a base case as well as a series of policy scenarios or management scenarios and give that information available to managers and let them come up with their own decisions. Um, another approach that we wanted to do was we had a team of scientists and we wanted to reach overall scientific consensus. Uh, so even if the science was a little bit um, in development and not clear cut, we would try to say that and we would try to come up with a consensus document. Another issue which was uh, a great source of tension and, and struggle between Kathy and myself was we wanted to be true to the science, but we wanted to be accessible to people who would be interested in this information. So it's a very difficult line to walk. Science is very complicated, and but I think it's important to convey that complexity without being overly complex. So I think it was a, it's an important uh, but challenging um, uh, path. And then finally, or not finally, we wanted to have incentives for scientists. We wanted top scientists involving, involved in this. And uh, it comes with a lot of uh, burden and headaches, and we wanted to try to provide some incentives to encourage scientists to participate so we could get good teams. And then finally, we wanted to have uh, policy impact from these, uh, these programs. So in terms of science links, there are some key features that I think uh, we're really sort of a mom and pop operation. Uh, so we didn't want to be too broad. So we have tended to have a regional focus, but we have tried to address problems that are nationally relevant. So we would partner with groups to try to uh, bring an overall national perspective, but the problem
problems in the analysis have been regionally focused. As I mentioned before, we have a team approach. We try to bring in a variety of people from a variety of disciplines that can address the overall problem, but top-notch scientists. We wanted to provide a variety of policy options to give the managers a range of what they might expect. If they do this, they might get that. If they do that, they might get something else. Another thing that is, I feel is very important, uh, but has been a challenge to maintain is uh, publish the results in a peer-reviewed article. And many of our articles have been published in Bioscience. It's a great outlet for this. Uh, but that comes at a, at a cost, particularly a time cost, um, because of the peer review process. But I think that's been absolutely critical to the success of the project. So each one of these has had a peer reviewed article, which really, I think, provides a good independent review of the work and helps ensure that it has credibility and subjective. Um, we also do a general audience translation document, which we take the peer-reviewed article, and we translate it so it's in a form that it's uh, readable to our target audience. Uh, we've developed a multi-dimensional outreach plan to try to ensure that we're successful. We've purposely focused on a few projects. We've had uh, four projects completed, and we're in the middle of the fifth. Uh, so we wanted to do not a lot of projects, but we really wanted to try to focus on quality and do a good job. So these are major projects. Uh, they involve a team of many people, you know, 10 to 15 people, two to four years, and they're several hundred thousand dollars uh, all tool to, um, to, to complete them. So they are pretty significant uh, operations. So getting into the nitty-gritty of the, uh, the overall thing, organization, um, so there's sort of an organizational stage. Uh, and first, we identify topics. Now we sort of field a, a wide range of topics that people are, are interested in doing. And we identify which one of these are the most compelling. Initially, the first topic that we came up with was acid rain, and in part because Hubbard Brook is uh, known for being the place where acid rain was first reported for North America. So that first topic for us was sort of a no-brainer. Other topics have been developed because for a variety of reasons, but clearly we have to identify a topic, and then we identify a scientist and policy expert lead. The first three topics were done by Kathy and myself. Uh, the fourth project was led by Gary Lovett, and the current project on carbon is being led by Tim Fahey at Cornell. We've hired a research associate in these projects to facilitate uh, the work as a go-between between the scientists and the managers help make the thing run. Um, we've assembled a team with a range of disciplines and views. I mentioned that previously. And also we've assembled a series of advisors to try to keep us on track with respect to the management issues. So if we look at the next slide, there's sort of a uh, diagram which shows the structure. The overall structure is organized through the Hubbardbrook Research Foundation. Uh, there's a policy analyst, program manager. First three projects, that was Kathy Lambert, and then I was the scientist uh, leading the project. But then under us, we have a series of, of folks who, who participate, including this postdoctoral fellow who was a go-between, a team of scientists ranging maybe from 8 to 15, uh, depending on the size and the scope of the project. Uh, we also have involved communications people to help us with our communications plans and our media training. I think critical to the success, success of the project is we've used a professional graphics designer who has been spectacular in terms of visual displays, which has helped make the reports very compelling. And then finally, we've had a series of policy advisors, advisors from a federal level and also a regional level to give us uh, good guidance on the overall direction and make sure we're, we're on track. And we've had, a, over the years, a number of folks who've, who've done this and have done a, a great job and taken it, it seriously and been very helpful. OK, so really the meat of the operation, in my opinion, is the synthesis. And um, we would, in, after the topic is identified and the team has been uh, brought on board,
board, we would meet a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the scope of the project. All these problems are very large in scope, but we need to, to frame them in a way that we can so that they're doable in, in the context of the project, and at the same time draft policy questions. Once we were clear on the scope, we would develop an outline and discuss data analysis and modeling activities that would be done as part of the project. Uh, we would review this with our advisors, and then we would undergo the process of writing the article, and eventually we would draft the article. Again, meet, circulate it with advisors, meet, discuss it, edit it, refine it, and finally it would be, be submitted for the, the peer-reviewed journal. Sounds very uh, short and sweet, but those of you who publish know it's anything but that. But then actually, from my perspective, the real hard work starts, and that's the outreach phase. The outreach phase is really done in parallel with the, uh, the synthesis phase. So I've sort of divided up into, here into three phases. The first phase is going on when we're developing the, uh, the synthesis volume. Uh, and right on the front end of this, we would develop a written communication plan so everybody was on board in terms of how we were going to communicate this information, and it was very clear in terms of what we were going to do. And then also early on, we developed a short fact sheet uh, that we distributed widely to our target audience. And the idea behind that was to get this idea out to our audience and then drum up interest in the overall project, which would follow. Following our discussion, our development of the synthesis article, we developed this general audience translation report, and our primary audience for the first four volumes was congressional staff and agency personnel. We had secondary audiences of regional um, uh, agencies, NGOs, and science educators. It's been very valuable for science education, but our primary audience was congressional staff and agency people. And also, we would, when we had the, um, the documents, the synthesis documents, we would then give conceptual diagrams to our graphics artists to prepare good quality visual materials. So that's sort of the, the first phase. We can move for temporarily to the next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about something that's been a real sort of eye-opener to me. This is something that Kathy has been drum drumming into me this idea of a communications triangle. Well, as I said on the front end, I'm trained as a scientist, so I sort of think like a scientist. And so scientists, they take a lot of information, background information, and then they sort of boil it down to experiments and approaches to evaluate their questions and do their research. And eventually they distill this down to a few ideas. Um, Non-scientists, I think, communicate or take scientific information differently. They're less interested in it than scientists are. So they really want to know the bottom line. They want to know the take-home message. And then to, to uh, a lesser extent, they want to know who cares? Why, why does this matter? What's the context of this message? And then finally, if they're really science geeks and they're really interested, they want the supporting details. So these general audience reports, we crafted them really as sort of what I would consider sort of a telescopic document where the beginning sections really uh, cut to the bottom line and then later in the document the, uh, the detailed information was, uh, was there. And I think in that regard they've been reasonably effective communication tools. Anyway, moving back uh, to slide 18, uh, the next phase prior to the release of the report, which is usually done coinciding with the uh, publication of the peer-reviewed article in bioscience, we crafted our final messages. And then something that's very important is we provide media training to the project team. Scientists have almost no experience dealing with media, so we thought it was important to train them in how to talk to reporters um, and uh, so I think this was critical to the success of the project and is a, a benefit to the, uh, to the project or to the participants. At least we sold it in that regard. And then uh, lastly, we began engaging the media. The overall article was embargoed, but 
but we would give uh, copies to selected media and we would do interviews um, uh, prior to the, uh, the embargo date. And then finally the third phase, we did a press conference at the press club and then that was followed up by congressional and agency briefings. And then we did a series of post-event activities, including follow-up interviews and additional lectures and, and briefings to, uh, to other group. So we move on to two slides here. This is sort of a repeat of what I've just been saying over the last couple minutes, but it shows that these aspects of the process are connected. So if we go to the top of the page, see if I can do this again, been here. This is sort of the start of the, of the wheel and it moves around this way. So we identify the issue, we uh, form the team, gather the data, do the synthesis, draft the paper, submit the paper, revise the paper, paper's published, and then we do follow-up activities. That's sort of center to the circle. And then outside, inside we have sort of these interactions with policy. So we seek input from the policy advisors, we track these policy activities. We gather comments from the advisors. We have a dialogue with people outside our advisors. We, we look at the policy landscape. We learn from the process. We do briefings. We do interviews. So there's this interaction from a policy perspective through the process. And then the outer ring is sort of the, the outreach or communication activities. We develop this fact sheet. We develop the communication strategy. We develop our messages that we want to put forward, we then prepare the general report, we do the graphics, we conduct the media training. And you can see the time frame in which these processes occur. We prepare media kits for people and uh, for the media, and then we do the press conference interviews and so on and so forth. So in general, these, this process has taken about two years, and it, it's fairly complicated, actually. It's been, it was an eye-opener for me. Uh, so now maybe we can go quickly through some of the projects uh, and uh, talk a little bit about them. As I mentioned, the first one was on acid rain. Acid rain revisited uh, the article, which is shown here. The cover was published in Bioscience in 2001, and it was really to look at um, how have ecosystems responded from acid rain. Acid rain was sort of a 70s issue. A lot of people thought the problem was solved. Uh, but where did we stand uh, with respect to uh, acid rain and, and its impacts on ecosystems? The next uh, project uh, was published in 2003. It was on nitrogen. It was a very, very complicated. Oh, maybe I should go back. I wanted to tell a little story here on this acid rain one. So it's interesting. One thing I learned in this process is that the success of the project is not always in your control. So the acid rain project, I had no idea what to expect, but it was, um, it turned out that this release happened within a week after uh, uh, George Bush um, uh, reneged on the Kyoto Protocol. So there was a lot of concern about air pollution and energy, and the amount of interest in this report was unbelievable. I was doing press, you know, interviews for months afterwards. I was completely overwhelmed, and I had no idea, you know, that it was going to be anything like this. The next article, as I started to talk about, was on nitrogen pollution. It was a fairly complicated uh, project looking at sources of nitrogen, including remote systems where nitrogen input from air pollution is important, but also very complex, large uh, uh, watersheds that drain into coastal waters uh, concerning uh, coastal uh, eutrophication. So it was very, uh, it was very complicated. And this, I was expecting great things from this, but this got relatively little attention. And uh, part of the reason was because this was released the week after we invaded Iraq. So everybody was thinking about Iraq and nobody was thinking about nitrogen pollution, so there was less impact than I was anticipating. The next one was on mercury, and uh, this one I strongly drove the 
doing the, the project. Hubberbrook doesn't have a large history of mercury research, but mercury was a uh, sort of a big deal. There's a lot of discussion about controls on mercury from electric utilities. There's a large data sets available. So I pushed this uh, fairly hard, and we did it, um, and was completed in 2007. Again, published in, in bioscience. Um, the next project was on monitoring the value of long-term monitoring. It was uh, led by Gary Lovett, uh, and there was a peer review article in Frontiers, and then a general um, uh, technical report published by the Forest Service. I'd like to talk a little bit about the outputs. I've got a table here. This is slide 25, summarizing some of the output activities from, from these. Um, so I've got as columns uh, acid rain, nitrogen, mercury, long-term monitoring the four projects. And you can see that there was uh, the first row. They all had a peer-reviewed article, in some cases multiple peer-reviewed articles. For example, the nitrogen report. Uh, people who, there's a lot of interest in nitrogen, and when people found out what we were doing, people from around the country wanted to contribute a synthesis paper for different regions of the country. So there were five articles that were published in bioscience. Um, and uh, for the first three, we had general audience reports. Uh, we try to keep track of the media reports. Those are shown next, and you can see the acid rain has a lot of media reports. I think we actually had quite a few on mercury, but the tracking system was a little bit problematic for us because of a change in technology that was used at the time. Uh, next are the scientific citations, so I leave it up to you to think whether that's a lot of scientific citations for a uh, for an initiative. And then following that are a series of rows on briefings. So we did congressional briefings for each of these. Uh, some of these we did congressional testimony. Um, and then we did a, a series of other briefings. Uh, we did a lot of work with uh, the various state attorney general's uh, offices because they were interested in air pollution issues. For the acid rain report, we've done teacher's guides and regional conference for mercury. Uh, at the time, the clean air mercury rule was being uh, discussed, and we did a lot of um, um, so we did a lot of work with uh, things on mercury initiative at the time. So just to give you a little bit of focused perspective, I put together this timeline, which talks about this from an air quality perspective. So this is a timeline uh, from 1990 to present. And um, air quality management in the country is a fairly complicated operation. So I've got rows on this figure for sort of legislative initiative administrative rules and judicial activities. And then the last row was sort of the science links. We had the four projects, acid rain in 2001, nitrogen in 2003, and mercury and long-term monitoring in 2007. So part of the motivation for the acid rain was to look at the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments and was it doing the job? Was it resulting in recovery? Um, and since that, there have been a number of proposals, legislative proposals, for additional reductions, some of them shown here, Clean Power Act, Clean Skies Act. And actually, the uh, 1990 Clean Air Act Amendment, um, the cap is, is projected to be reached in 2010. It was actually uh, attained this past year. Um, but it's very, very much a long-term uh, problem. Uh, there have been, because of the complexity of the Clean Air Act, there have been a number of administrative rules to try to jumpstart the process. The nitrogen, or excuse me, the Ozone Transport Commission, which ultimately resulted in the nitrogen budget program, and our nitrogen report and acid rain reports helped inform that. This little arrow here shows that it's uh, uh, there was a lawsuit involved, and then um, also the Clean Air Interstate Rule and the Clean Air Mercury Rule. Um, which were signed in 2005, but then went to the courts. The Clean Air um, Clean Air Interstate Rule was remanded in uh, 2008, and the Clean Air Mercury Rule was vacated in 2008. And then on the, the judicial, there's been a series of new source review cases and a nuisance case, and the attorney generals have been very interested in these reports. So 
I leave it to others to discuss what the impact is, but I think the idea is with it, that this has helped inform the process. The last project, which I'll just mention briefly because it's in progress, but I think the idea is to submit this to bioscience, is on local scale carbon management. Um, there's a lot of interest in carbon sequestration and carbon management. And so for this project, which is led by Tim Fahey, uh, um, eight carbon, detailed carbon budgets are being developed for eight counties in the northeast. Uh, those counties are shown here. And if you, we go to the next slide, I can show you just to whet your appetite for this. These are just the uh, carbon budgets for these counties, and they're ranged from left to right. Um, in order of population density. So we've got Baltimore, a highly urban system, to Coos County and Grafton County in, in New Hampshire, which are very rural. And the upper panel shows the carbon emission, the middle panel shows the carbon sequestration, and the lower panel shows the net carbon release. And the idea behind this is that local governments are very interested in carbon management and what sort of activities that could they do to, to optimize their, their carbon management. So this is, as I said, in process and, um, and uh, will be coming out soon. So to try to wrap this up, a um, couple other things, just some, some overall ideas and strategies. Um, one thing we did, our decision was that we're a scientific organization, and this is very much a science-centric initiative. So we did not form stakeholder groups. You know, we really were science scientists working with policy people to help focus the science in terms of this, uh, this translation and uh, outreach effort. We really focused on the synthesis. We tried to use both uh, long-term data sets and models to regionalize the, uh, the data sets. And we tried to focus on a few what we thought were important concepts. So for acid rain, we we're focusing on recovery and the rate of recovery. For mercury, are there mercury hotspots in the landscape? And I think Kathy will attest that we, we agonized over the translation. She would write the document, I would go over it, and she would think it was too complicated, and we'd go back and forth and back and forth, really line by line. So we spent a tremendous amount of time in those general reports. Um, and I think that they probably more time than actually writing the article, and I think that, that they've been generally fairly successful. Um, as I said, we're a small operation, so we try to partner with other groups as much as possible to improve our effort, expand our efforts, such as ESA, um, certainly AIBS through bioscience publication, for society, turn general's offices, and other regions. Uh, scientists in other regions would get wind of what we were doing and try to uh, engage us. So th that was very critical, and particularly in terms of the nitrogen uh, project. Uh, we developed written communication plans, and we conducted media training so our participants would understand that side of the, uh, of the operation. Uh, we developed supplemental communication materials. I mentioned these, these general reports. We also would do summaries. And then we provided graphics and PowerPoint presentations and posters so our participants could take these materials, use them, and get the information out to the community, their communities. Uh, then we created a series of linked releases so that our our success was not really uh, directed at uh, at one one day uh, event. Okay, so a little bit on assessment. Assessment, I think, is a real challenge, and some aspects of it are easier than others. In terms of process, you know, one question is, do we deliver on outcomes that we defined at the outset? Well, we can review our results and see how we did, but in fact, these are fairly long, complicated projects, and often what we intended at the, at the beginning evolved and changed, hopefully for the better, uh, but that's something that we do as part of each project to look at where we ended up compared to where we started. Another question was support provided to the participants, and was it a good experience? We want people to participate in these things, so we would survey scientists after each one and get their input and try to improve the uh, operation. I think people are generally supportive and enjoy the operation. Um, did we provide resources and training to support uh, the science? So we pay every scientist a modest stipend to try to encourage their engagement, and then we would provide this media training and provide interaction with policymakers and, uh, uh, and media uh, so help help this 
facilitate that that part of the, the process. Next, in terms of content, did we effectively evaluate the policy options without being advocates? This is a huge challenge to uh, to assess. Inevitably, after these projects projects, I would get criticized from all sorts of people, either we were being advocates or we weren't advocating enough or this and that. So we would have to get these comments from external scientists about how we did. And also, we that was very important in terms of charging our advisors to try to, to keep us online as being objective and not being advocates. Um, did we make a value contribution to the literature? Well, we can gauge this from scientific citations, and I showed you some of those numbers. Were the translation pieces accessible to non-scientists to actually interpret the results? Well, we can review media coverage and look at other articles that refer to article our work for accuracy, but that, that is a challenge uh, to do, not, not at all straightforward. Finally, how about the policy outreach impact? Did we achieve, well, we can track the media coverages and we can review the specific outlets. We would like to try to impact, uh, we would try to, try to have our work uh, cited in high impact outlets, you know, such as the New York Times, the Boston Globe, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, have policy decisions at the state, regional, and national level reference science links, will we review congressional records and other reports to see if, if our work is referenced. That is a very imperfect process, I think, as well, hard, hard to gauge. Were policy decisions consistent with results? Well, we can look at what has happened. So I tried to do that with that uh, timeline that I showed you previously and to see whether or not we are having an impact, whether we are helping inform uh, uh, decision making. Okay, so just to close up, just a couple of thoughts, uh, and then we can open up for questions. Um, and this is very much a work in progress, and um, so we're constantly thinking about how we do this, can we do it better? Um, so a couple, couple thoughts. Um, one is it's a big uh, effort to do this type of synthesis and integration. It's not something that's done at the back end of a project. It requires people and resources uh, to do it effectively. Um, so I gave you an idea of the scope and the, and the cost and the time. And so you can see that they are significant projects. Um, another big issue are the timelines. Um, the, our board and our executive director is always giving me pushback that these take too long, they're too complicated. Um, and I think that there are advantages and disadvantages to the timelines. Um, it's not all a disadvantage. People want information out instantaneously to form uh, problems and uh, management issues. But lots of times these problems are long-term problems and they don't go away instantaneously. So having these longer-term projects gives the team the background and the time to learn about the management and policy landscape and help inform the process in a, in a reasonable way to show where the science can really help uh, provide information. And that takes time uh, to do. Um, another big challenge we have and one thing we continuously debate are these one-shot deals or do we need to upgrade these continuously. Should we not do a large number? Should we just do update acid rain every five years? Because there's certainly an ongoing need for this. And how do we partner with groups to try to, uh, you know, to do this and keep this information fresh? So there's no right or wrong answer for that. Charlie? Yes? We have two questions actually on the floor. So if you want to pause, I can ask those. We can do this, um, but I'm on my last slide. Okay. <laughs> so why don't I do this, and then we'll, we'll we'll open up for questions if that's okay. Sounds great. Okay. So the final thing I think is that the final two thoughts are that it's I think it's really I really enjoyed this tremendously. It's really turned you know around what I do. It's very rewarding, but it's not for everyone. Some people are good at it. Some people are less good at it. Um, but I think it needs to be built in. 
to the way we think. And you can see this in NSF, that you have the broader impacts. Um, but it, we need to sort of think through who should be doing this. I mean, I think that there are advantages to thinking about having younger people. Often this type of work is done by more senior people. I'm certainly in that camp. But I think having younger people think about this is a good thing. And I think the NSF uh, um, focus is uh, is helping to do that. But are there incentives within tenure and and uh, our positions that would would allow us to do that, uh, give us the opportunity to do that? And then finally, this is certainly relevant to scientists, but it's also relevant to managers and and science journalists. So. You know, sort of a question is how do we communicate with these groups to to refine and, and improve our our product? So maybe we could have Kathy come on and and have her say a few things and then open it up for questions if that's possible. Great. Can you ask Kathy to uh, indicate what her phone number is via chat? Sure. I can figure out how to do this. <laughs> I'm just gonna unmute, unmute all your lines. Oh, right she's now. got yeah, she's got Find her phone. Noise. She's got her phone phone number on there. Okay. Background noise um, is a is a factor. So. So do you want me to give it to you? I'm unmuting everyone's line, and okay. I'll unmute Kathy's right now as well. Oh, I had one other slide I should put up here at the end, and that is um, if you're interested in these reports, uh, you can go to the Hubbardbrook uh, Research Foundation website and download them. If you would like a hard copy, uh, you can just send me an email for whatever ones you want, and I can stick a hard copy in the mail for you. And so I've got my contact information in the Hubbardbrook Research Foundation website there on the last slide. Sure. Hi, this is, uh, this is Kathy Sound Lambert, um, and I definitely have to reiterate a lot of um, what Charlie said, and that it's been an amazing project to work on, and I think we've all learned a lot along the way. Um, probably one of the most important things I would say is that we tried from the beginning, and I think I believe even strongly, more strongly now, that this work is not a matter of the end of the pipe translation and communication, but it really has to be an integrated project where the policy and the communications work is defined and integrated right from the start. Um, everything about the project really hinged on our ability to do that. And that's, um, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to figure out how to match the scientific knowledge and information from a given site or a collection of sites in a region to pressing regional and national policy issues. Um, we had to really study up on things like what were the different legislative proposals for the amendments to the Clean Air Act and what specific emission reduction levels should we target when using something like a PNET model to provide that information outside of an advocacy context for the consequences of policy decisions. And there were other examples of that, too, in the case of nitrogen that came up at a time where not only were there air quality management issues on the table, but water quality as well. So a lot of TMDL, or total maximum daily load, discussions happening at the state level, and we had to think about that when we're looking at the watershed budgets that we created so that we could try to provide information on the contribution of, say, atmospheric deposition versus other inputs. So... All along, we really had to integrate. Um, the other thing I would say is that the media work, it wasn't something that I think at the outset we really thought was going to be as much a part of the project as it really turned out to be. Um, we learned through the first project and the futures assessment process that to inform public policy, in many cases members of Congress are looking for validation from their constituents, and the second, the, an indicator of that 
interest is media coverage. So we saw media as a way of amplifying our voice to members of Congress and, and demonstrating to others the public significance of the work that was being done. And Charlie was kind not to put in too many examples of the sort of bumps and bruises from that process, but <laughs> we could both tell stories about embargoes being broken and released timelines being off and, you know, other people releasing our information before we were ready, <laughs> that kind of thing. Journalists, you know, um, reporting on kind of the wrong story. So we learned a lot along the way, but I think that in the end, we really tried to focus on keeping the integrity of the science and the scientists and the players involved um, at the front of the, the sort of the top of the priority list. And if that meant missing an opportunity here or there, you know, we felt better to do that in the short term than to than to um, jeopardize the credibility of the project. So I guess I'd leave it at that for now, and certainly happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Kathy. Just a note, um, there's too much background noise to unmute all your lines simultaneously, but you can unmute your own line and ask a question by pressing star seven. Hi, Charlie, this is Robert Gott. Um Can you explain a little bit more? So the price tag, it, it looks like, for the Lynx program was 200 to 250 um, over that four-year period. Was that how, – how exactly did you get that funding? Was that cobbled together from foundations, or were there federal agencies supportive of, of grant augmentations, or, or was that a huge challenge and time commitment to get that funding? Or can you just talk a little bit about how you got the resources to make it happen? Sure. I'll, I'll start, and then Kathy is actually more knowledgeable about that aspect of it than I am. But – Initially, uh, a lot of the funding has come from foundations and um, that are interested in science communication. And when we first were trying to raise money for the project, a lot of these foundations could actually care less about acid rain, but they were very interested in this problem and process. A lot of the initial funding that we got was really to to look at this model for science communication and see if we could uh, advance something. But uh, the vast majority of the funding was from various uh, foundations. There, there is a group uh, in um, New York called uh, New York uh, Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, which um, funds uh, energy-related work and has an outreach component. We were able to get a little bit of funding from them for some of the projects, um, but most of it's been from, uh, from foundations. Kathy, do you want to add anything to that? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. There was a little bit of, of government support there through NYSERDA, but mostly private foundations, and, and yes, it definitely takes a lot of time to do that. Um, and it adds to the timeline. You know, oftentimes you have to conceive the project and have, a, have an approach in mind before you can even go to a foundation. And then their review and funding time frame could be another three to six months or longer to get a decision on a grant. So at the, at the beginning of the ScienceLinks program, we bundled the, um, the acid rain, nitrogen, mercury, and carbon projects together. And we knew that multi-pollutant proposals going through Congress were, kind of, were going to be on the table for several years and that there would be regional action as well. So we tried to um, pull all of those topics together as part of the initial science links grant funding proposal that would went into foundations. But it meant, it meant you know, maintaining relationships and, and doing proposals with probably, oh, 10 or so different foundations and, you know, visiting foundation officers and all that kind of work. But I think they've been quite supportive of the products and, and the impact. So we've gotten, I think we've gotten pretty good feedback, uh, pretty positive feedback. So. We have some questions on the floor from earlier. Um, I'll just read them off. And please, if it's your question and you want to chime in, 
star seven again to unmute your line. But this is from Jonathan Long, and he asked, with which other groups do you interact that are focused on similar challenges? Okay, um, that really varies with um, with the problem, but um, we these fact sheets that I mentioned that we send out, uh, we would send them out broadly, and then we would give you know lectures and uh, uh, public uh, briefings and things like that as part of the process. And so people would come out and, and, and approach, uh, approach us, but we would try to create additional critical mass. So when we would go to Washington for, uh, for congressional briefings or agency briefing, briefings, often groups were not interested in if it was solely a regional issue. So we would want to try to partner with groups from other parts of the country. So when we did a, uh, a presentation, a congressional presentation, uh, on acid rain, we would bring somebody in from the southeast, someone from the far west, so we could put together a more national perspective. Um, so there were just sort of logical alliances that uh, that happened. We were when the attorney generals, uh, various state attorney generals' offices, got wind of what we were doing. We had given them a variety of briefings on what we had learned. Uh, and we interact with them because they were they were interested in these uh, in these problems uh, and industrial groups industrial groups uh, have uh, you know heard about what we were doing or saw one of the reports and were interested and we would give briefings so there were just sort of logical alliances that would would come up or uh, that we would try to take advantage of. Uh, some of the agencies in the nitrogen project were very interested in looking at the interactions between sort of ecosystem health and human health drivers. So we partnered with people who were interested in, uh, who were doing research and outreach on human health effects of air pollution and did some briefings to try to show the, the interactions and the sort of co-benefits from human health and ecosystem health. So. Things came up that we would try, um, you know, to just to try to create critical mass and to broaden uh, the message and the extent of the impact. Hey, Charlie, this is Jonathan. I guess the question I was actually um, interested in was uh, to what extent are you interacting with other groups on these communication and synthesis issues, not not the particular science okay, I issues. Got you. I got you. Space, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Are, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, that's all helpful to on the science questions, too, but I'm thinking, are there other groups that are kind of dealing with the same kind of, you know, challenge of, of communicating the science that you're networking with, or are you, is it, you know, in, in or, uh, informal or formal kind of networks that you may be tapping into? Well, Kathy was instrumental in uh, helping us interact with a, uh, a group of uh, sort of science journalists, and they were, they've been very, very helpful uh, to us in terms of sort of wading through the, the media communications uh, networks. In terms of science groups, they're trying to get the message out. Um, uh, the, uh, at the Cary conference that I was at with, uh, with Rob uh, a couple months ago, uh, that was the theme of the conference. And... Um, uh, and so there were people there, groups there that I wasn't uh, familiar with, and that was a good opportunity. In terms of the specifics, we um, we have not, and maybe Kathy can uh, can chime in here, but we have not had a lot of um, uh, interactions with uh, groups in terms of developing our ideas. These these were sort of a trial and error type of uh, approach, but. We have actually had uh, other groups from other regions ask us to come and talk to them about how we do this and give them briefings because they're interested in, in learning from our, our mistakes and, and trying similar efforts in other, uh, other parts of the country. So I think our, our interactions with other groups that are interested in science communication have been fairly limited, but maybe, Kathy, you could say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is generally true. I would add a couple of players maybe um, 
you know, the scientific societies, I think, are very helpful when it comes to planning things down in D.C. You know, we were up here in New Hampshire and spread out, so, when you know, when we went to do something in D.C., it was really helpful to have a contact there who could help do the groundwork and um, partner with that and who had experience presenting science um, without too strong an agenda. So ESA and AIBS, um, I think, are, are very good resources for that. We also um, started to – we interact with – there's a group called the Science Communications Network, which is a, sort of a subsidiary of Fenton Communications, which is a pretty standard, large communications firm out of New York City. And Science Communications Network um, is the um, follow-on to what was Environmental Media Services, and um, their really their aim is to help scientists um, amplify their research through the media. So we have worked with them a little bit. Um, usually, I would play that liaison role and not pull each individual scientist into that. Um, but there are um, those kinds of groups are helpful. And then I think you know looking to the NGOs and industry groups from um, from a strategy perspective. Both those communities do this work very well, and there's a lot to be learned from how they approach their releases and their communications work. Um, and the key thing there, at least for us, was to then modify that and, and do it ourselves rather than depend on those groups to, to be the voice for the work. There's another question chatted in. Um, a little while ago by Marty Downs. You mentioned incentives for scientists to participate. What form has that taken? Okay, so we, uh, we would give each scientist a stipend. So these are very modest incentives, I, I should add. But uh, we would give everybody a stipend, so they would get um, uh, part of it uh, for once the journal article was submitted and second half of it when the project was uh, was completed, so they were sort of involved in the synthesis, but they're also involved in the outreach. So when we would uh, when we would project when we would we'd develop this team, we would brainstorm about who we wanted, and then for the projects that I was the leader on, I would go and I would talk to each one of the scientists and try to uh, tell them what we were looking for, just to make sure that they were going they were going to sign on for the whole thing, including the outreach phase. Um, so they obviously are involved in in peer reviewed articles, so they 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 have a, a an output that uh, that they can uh, point to. Uh, they get the stipend, and then if they're interested in um, uh, interactions with the media and policy groups. You know, the Hubberbrook Research Foundation through the Science Links program provides that in a sort of a controlled way. So we, I mentioned that we do the media training. Uh, so we have a workshop and 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 talk about uh, how to be effective in terms of uh, interacting with the media and how to interact with uh, with resource managers to try to give scientists some guidance in those uh, those activities. So those are our, you know, those are the incentives that we try to uh, um, we try to put forward in terms of, you know, then people go out and interacting with larger groups and give briefings. We would provide um, uh, visuals, PowerPoint presentations, things like that that they could use for their for their their talks and their seminars and their briefings. Um, so we try to give you know some training uh, in addition to a modest uh, stipend. And I think one of the things we heard early on in the, when we did the Futures Assessment Project was that a lot of scientists who cared about the policy impact or the management impact of their work would find themselves going to kind of meeting after meeting, and they would be one voice among many, and sometimes that voice would be lost, or the other people around the table didn't really understand the significance of the science they were trying to introduce. So I think we also tried to say, you know, we'll we'll try not to ask you to do um, an endless number of multi-stakeholder meetings, but rather target your time um, and help deliver the information to influence leaders in a concise way that we think will have high impact. Debbie Collison. Oh, sorry, Kathy. 
Um, I'm sorry, Marty Downs here again. I just wanted to follow up, Charlie. Yep. Is, um, is there an advantage in having it housed in the research foundation rather than at one of the universities? No, I just think that there is um, – I think that um, the, the advantage, I think, for doing the research foundation – well, the research foundation is interested in doing this outreach, so they're, they're interested in doing mm. this. I think also that they can bring in people from different institutions. So if you were from, let's say, if it was done at Syracuse, the people at Syracuse would want to use Syracuse people and have uh, – Syracuse get the lion's share of the credit. So this right. way we can use – I mean, I think the, the key to the success is getting good people who are very interested in this or committed to it and are, have, you know, are top scientists who the, the, the managers or the policymakers will, will listen to. And so we want to – you know, those people come from different institutions, and so we want to be able to spread the, the credit around, and I think that's – you know, that's relatively easy to do with a Upper Brook Research Foundation. Um, right. So I think that, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to, uh, you know, to uh, everything. And also, you know, this is specifically for science links. Um, uh, there was also a question I saw about uh, problems from academics uh, dealing with uh, – dealing with um, – uh, policy people or resource managers, and I think that this is sort of a interface organization that provides some buffering uh, uh, to facilitate that. So I know that when I would go down and talk to people in Congress, I'm much more effective if I've got Kathy there than if I go in by myself, because I think that uh, that you know politicians and their staff are very comfortable. You know, she 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 can talk to them, and they're they're very comfortable with it. So it's sort of a an organization that can can facilitate that and 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 appear to be objective in trying to just advance science rather than you know a hidden agenda. Thanks. Hello, are there additional questions? Uh, so there were a couple other questions that I saw here. I'm not sure if they're in the right order, uh, but one was about is this a one-way exchange or a two-way exchange of information? And I think that when I first went into this process, I was envisioning that it was a one-way exchange, that the science would be translated and go out to the, uh, the resource managers and the media to the, to the general public. And I learned uh, early on in the process that to be successful, it has to be a two-way exchange. So I think that one of the valuable parts of the process and part the length of the process, even though I get hammered on this all the time, is learning this management policy landscape, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm dealing with scientific issues, and I'm not really up on those things, as are often my colleagues who are doing these things. So it takes a while, and it takes dialogue, and it takes interaction to really understand these issues and to try to show how the science can inform this. And present the science in a way that can inform this. So I think it's very much a, uh, a two-way uh, exchange, and that's really critical to the success. But I should say it's definitely a science-centric operation, and we're trying to control it if we can control it from a science uh, perspective. There was another question uh, about um, opportunities for students, REUs, and uh, so I mentioned that we're very interested in expanding this out and having an educational component. Uh, so we are developing, uh, I don't do this, but people who know about uh, science education are taking these uh, documents and translating them as uh, guides for, or for teachers. And we also have a REU program uh, which is uh, 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 done through Plymouth State University, which is a small school adjacent to Hubbard Brook, 
uh, where we have kids come in and they do science, but they also are working on, as part of their project, they work on science communication and science translation. Uh, and there's a, a sponsor that is a NGO or a government sponsor that's interested in this uh, translation piece, and it takes on a variety of forms. It could be a demonstration for a museum, or it could be a poster, or it could be a PowerPoint presentation, but they do a science communication product, and that's part of our, uh, our training. So we have, been, we have been branching out to try to involve uh, uh, students and teachers as well. This is Kathy. Um, you know, one question I have and continue to have is what role could or should some of the um, science funding agencies play in work like this, whether it's through NSF or LTER? And, um, it, it, it does seem to me that there's an interest in this kind of work and the broader impacts criteria of the NSF grant sort of suggests that they want this work to happen, but I haven't seen any programs yet that put funding into this kind of work, certainly more funded for the um, for the education, K-12 education piece. But And that might be for anybody in the group to uh, speculate on. I don't see any uh, additional questions in the chat, Charlie and Kathy. I think you've addressed them all. Um, if there aren't any other questions. Actually, so this is Robert. I just wanted to leave with one last thought and, and request of everyone. First of all, I want to thank everyone for, for joining the webinar and especially um, Charlie and, and Kathleen for your excellent presentation. Um, we're, we're looking at the possibility of doing similar um, webinars in the future, so anyone who has any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to, to send me your, your thoughts. Um, I hope this was, was valuable. I know I found it very interesting, and Kathy's point around um, federal funding agencies supporting this effort is something that that I know we here at AIBS are, are trying to find ways to, to help COD. So um, any support for that or, or ideas, please, again, feel free to contact us, and, and um, we'll do what we can on that front. So that's from, from my side. I just want to, again, say thank you to everyone, and, and I think we're, we're about done. One last housekeeping note. Um, the recording, which includes um, – the slides will be available via URL, um, and we'll send that out to the participants shortly. <laughs>